Almighty God. Through your only Son, you overcame death and opened us to the light of eternity. Enlighten our minds and kindle our hearts with the presence of your Spirit, that we may hear your words of comfort and challenge for us this day. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I'm getting tired of seeing people's faces. I mean, I see people's faces from an acceptable social distance and with a mask. I only see the eyes and the forehead, though. I'm getting good at reading eyebrows. <laughs> there is a thing called Zoom fatigue. And oh yes, there are researchers who are studying it. A researcher at Stanford University suggests that during in-person meetings, People aren't staring into your face from a close distance. Some might be typing notes or reading ahead on the agenda, but video calls disrupt the natural rhythm, forcing everyone who is logged in to stare at each other, a phenomenon known as hypergaze. Like many of you, I have been on my fair share of Zoom meetings during the last year, where one or more people, I'll say it nicely, are video camera challenged. <laughs> the angle of the camera is slightly askew, others are focused clearly on their foreheads, or awkwardly pointed downward so you don't even see their face at all, or just extremely, extremely close to one's nose. The researcher suggests from an evolutionary standpoint, if somebody is very close to you and staring right at you, this meant that you were going to mate or get into a fight. <laughs> well, as you can tell, it creates a lot of stress. People on high alert. During in-person meetings, people also don't feel the need to exaggerate their non-verbal <laughs> behavior. Nor are people forced to stare at themselves. Again, video calls, video calls upend the norm. So in the last few weeks, I have rediscovered the telephone. There is something comforting, again, about focusing on someone's voice. Listening to someone's voice over the phone, whom you can't see up close, has new significance for me. I put the focus on the conversation. I think of a call that I shared with a good friend on Friday. Her friendship has sustained me through most difficult parts of my life. I remember what she looks like, and her voice is familiar. Her voice is engaging and encouraging. It's a trusted voice. It's comforting, isn't it, to hear a familiar voice. In our text this morning from the Gospel of John, a, John is a part of a larger discourse of when Jesus says, I am statements. I am the good shepherd. This reflects this lovely imagery of a shepherd. A shepherd is one whose voice is known and followed by the sheep in his care. There is, of course, the stated, unstated problem, really. If Jesus is a good shepherd, representing the Lord who is our shepherd, then who are we? Well, Barbara Brown Taylor, of course, says that we are the sheep. She calls us the woolly ones. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. My sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. There is a bond that exists between the sheep and the shepherd, the relationship grows, and usually the shepherd and sheep develop a way of communicating that others don't understand. Well, sheep will not go anywhere if the shepherd does not go first. They need a shepherd who will go ahead of them to show them that things are all right and that they will be safe and cared for. That's all we really want right now, right? To know that we are safe and cared for, to know that our loved ones are safe and cared for, to know that all of God's children in this city and in this world 
are safe and cared for? Well, the notion of safety and security is certainly being put to the test. It has been quite a week. We search for a familiar voice and comforting words, reminding us of God's unwavering and loving care for each of us. Who has been that comforting voice for you in a time of unrest? You may know someone who provides a calm and comforting presence. You may be that person for someone else. Maybe you turn to a podcast with a speaker who has a very soothing voice. Maybe you turn on some smooth jazz. Maybe you, t- you turn to scripture and the collection of the Psalms for comfort in these times. Perhaps the melody that Jamie sang a few moments ago reminds us of a calm and comforting presence. Well, the verdict of the Derek Chauvin trial was announced Tuesday in the murder of George Floyd. For some, there was relief. For others, cautious optimism. For others, there's still pessimism that it took so long. And yet another black life had to die to come to a potential turning point in our justice system. But in the 24 hours immediately around the Tuesday's verdict, six more police shootings happened across our country. The current public health epidemic of gun violence on our streets and at the hands of police has got to stop. It does not cease at this time. One of those happened in our city. Another black child of God was killed on our streets, on our city streets. We say her name, Micaiah Bryant, a 16-year-old full of life, full of energy, part of a mentoring group at our high school, got in a fight and was shot by a Columbus police officer. Unfortunately, in our city, this is not new. Three black men have been killed by police since December 4th of 2020. We'll say their names too. Casey Goodson Jr., Andre Hill, Miles Jackson. And now with Micaiah, four more black souls at the hands of Columbus police. Family and friends and the whole community left in the wake of yet another tragedy. People in our city, especially people of color in our city are on high alert. Tensions are high. We long to hear the voice of one who will lead us beside still waters instead of the raging torrent of recent months. We strain for comforting words to restore our souls. But instead, there are so many distracting voices providing dissonance dissonance instead of clarity. It makes it hard to hear the voice of a shepherd. After the week we've had, I don't think there's a substitute for the feeling of security that comes from knowing that you're the object of someone's constant care and, com- and concern. It's comforting to hear the, a familiar voice. In times when anxiety and fear hold us more than our patience and our courage allow, we need to be reassured that someone will not only journey with us, but will go ahead of us. A New Testament scholar, Matt Skinner, suggests that maybe one way to understand a calming presence of a good shepherd's care is to experience the distress caused by its absence. Think about it. We're seeing it yet again. When people and systems we employ shepherd our public safety fail to protect and serve black and brown bodies. When a greedy wolf shows up or an opportunistic hired hand runs in the other direction, you know it and you feel it, that your whole body experiences a threat, feelings of terror 
and worry and abandonment get embedded in our bones and in our systems. He suggests that there are too many toxic effects of the lack of a good shepherd. The lingering effects of a narcissistic and deceitful political leadership. The pandemic fueled anxiety dreams. Nowhere to hide from predatory racism that roams on our streets and the flood of microaggressions in our daily life. This is too much the generational experience of our black and brown siblings who do not feel safe on our streets. And when we're aware of the absence of a shepherd's care, we are called together as a community to listen, to pray for a way forward, to identify one whose voice is known and trusted. Well, the image of the shepherd and sheep is very central to the narrative of the Christian faith that we can tell about the God who has come to us in Jesus Christ. The story that we tell our children. That a trusted shepherd seeks the welfare of the flock and seeks to lead the flock in God's ways toward God's good future. Part of the reason that sheep trust the voice of the shepherd is because they know that she'll go first. That the sheep know that the shepherd will always experience the journey before they do. So that the sheep will have no need to fear being abandoned or purposefully led into danger. The shepherd never leads a sheep to the place that she herself has not been or has not experienced has not touched or walked first. It says a lot about our Christian faith. That is incarnation. That God becomes flesh and blood in a baby born to this world through a woman. And that is crucifixion. That God experiences betrayal and suffering and death firsthand. Not escaping it, but willing it, willingly entering into it. That is also resurrection. God wrenching forth new life out of old, new possibility out of a tragedy, refusing to let death have the last word and emptying it of its power. This picture of Jesus as the good shepherd reminds us that he will always lead us on the paths that he has already walked. And that is what we claim as we follow God in the way of Jesus as an Easter people. We claim that in Jesus Christ, all of life and death has been hallowed, made holy. That we claim that our, God, our good shepherd has traveled all the paths and will take in our lives. That our good shepherd has already experienced the journey firsthand so that we can be assured of God's, God's presence along our way. Let me offer that Jesus knows your name, the one who calls you and leads you, the one who created you and abides within you and will not forsake you, especially not in these days of chaos and uncertainty and pandemic fatigue and loneliness. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd, the one who lays down his life for the sheep. One more interesting point of this text is that it's often used to exclude people. Christian exclusivism. It's often used to support an argument about whom God saves and whom God doesn't save who gets into the fold and who doesn't. That the sheep are never in charge of actually figuring that part out. The shepherd is the one who can call the flock together, who forms all of them into the sheep family and who leads them wherever they are to go. The sheep are just brought into the flock. They simply have to learn how to abide with one another and live together and figure out unity together. It 
It's not the sheep's decision whom God chooses. Those decisions are left up to the shepherd and to God. And a few verses later, Jesus says that as other sheep that are not even in, uh, are a part of the particular fold. Jesus has other sheep that are not part of the fold. And it would not surprise me one bit if our shepherd has a much bigger flock than any of us could ever even begin to imagine. And therefore, a pasture big enough for everyone to find a place to graze. It is Jesus, the good shepherd, who leads us into the future, even if that future is uncertain. That we know bad things will happen this week is full of evidence of that. That there will be other tough weeks ahead. But the good news that we hold this day as we continue on our journey with God in this Easter season and is the journey that God has in store for you and for me. That we go forward with the assurance that we are not traveling alone. That the shepherd never leaves us alone. That when we walk through life's darkest valleys and in the shadows, God will be with us, never to abandon us or leave us to our own devices but that God offers protection and comfort. And out of all of that, somewhat surprisingly, a life of abundance. And for that, we give thanks. Thanks be to God.